What is the Kohima Epitaph, and what's it got to do with Britain's forgotten battle that changed the Second World War? Well, those of you living in the UK and who attend Remembrance Sunday services will probably know the words, even if you don't know the story behind them. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. The memorial that bears those powerful words stands in a cemetery containing the graves of over 1,400 British servicemen and memorials to over 900 Indian troops who died alongside them. They died in one of the bloodiest, toughest and grimmest battles of the Second World War, a battle sometimes called the Stalingrad of the East. Outnumbered six to one, and half of whom were non-combat units, the multinational British garrison stood their ground in bloody hand-to-hand fighting, refusing to retreat or surrender for two weeks until relieved. And even then, the battle continued for another vicious month. That stand stopped the Japanese invasion of India in its tracks and turned the tide of the war in Southeast Asia. Both for its ferocity and its turning point in the war, it's been called Britain's greatest battle. And yet it's almost completely forgotten, rather like the army that fought against the Japanese in Burma. So, as we near Remembrance Sunday, I think it's time to reveal the story of the Battle of Kohima in 1944. Following the attack on Pearl Harbour, the Japanese also launched an invasion of Southeast Asia, principally to secure raw materials for her war effort. In a series of lightning offensives, they secured the oil fields of the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, and captured the British colonies of Malaya and Singapore, not forgetting the American-controlled Philippines. They then turned their attention west to another British colony, Burma. Their successful invasion resulted in the longest retreat in the history of the British army, over 1,000 miles, all the way back to the border with India. By 1943, the British were finally able to hold the all-conquering Japanese at bay with the creation of the multinational 14th Army, commanded by General William Bill Slim. The 14th Army not only included men from the British and Indian armies, but also smaller contingents from Nepal and Burma, as well as infantry divisions from West and East Africa too. Slim restored the morale of the Allied forces and started, tentatively, to push back. Firstly, the Chindit raids took the war to the Japanese, and then he launched a limited offensive in the Arakan area on the Burmese coast. By the end of the war, the 14th Army numbered over one million men. But away from the European theatre and the fight against the Nazis, these men fighting in the jungles of Burma, far away from newsreels, seemed, even at the time, to be forgotten by many people back home. And in that classic ironic humour of the British, they nicknamed themselves the Forgotten Army. And it was this Forgotten Army who fought one of Britain's greatest but forgotten battles, Kohima. For over two months, they fought a bitter, bloody, hand-to-hand battle with a numerically superior Japanese enemy. In March 1944, the Japanese, following the maxim that the best defence is attack, launched an ambitious offensive, codenamed Yugo, from Burma into northeastern India. The Japanese offensive by their 15th Army was principally a spoiling strategy to prevent the Allies launching their own offensives and also to seize the supply depot and airfields at Imphal, thus cutting an air supply route to the Chinese. However, the Japanese commander, Lieutenant General Mutaguchi, had bigger ambitions. He believed he was destined to command the Japanese in a decisive battle and topple British rule in India. Mutaguchi would indeed preside over a decisive battle, but it would not be quite the outcome he envisaged. Far from it. His 15th Army consisted of three whole divisions, plus a division from the Indian National Army, the latter principally recruited from Indian POWs who'd supported the cause of independence from the British Raj. General Sato's 31st Division, consisting of 12,000 men, advanced on the hilltop town of Kohima. Kohima is on a ridge running north to south, alongside the road from Dimapur to Imphal. Surrounded by dense forests, it's about 400 watt yards or 400 metres wide and is broken by a series of gullies. It was the administrative centre of the Nagaland and the British Deputy Commissioner's bungalow and tennis court sat effectively at its centre. By capturing Kohima, the Japanese would isolate Imphal from its main supply base at Dimapur. Indeed, the latter's massive supply dumps, covering an area 11 miles long by 1 mile wide, were also in General Mutaguchi's sights. Once General Sato had taken Kohima, his superior envisaged him splitting his 31st Division, with one half heading south 
to help finish off the besieged Imphal, and the other heading north to capture the supply dump. But General Mutaguchi was, to use the expression, counting his chickens before they hatched, as you're going to find out. Even as the Japanese advanced through the dense jungle, General Slim, who was aware of the size of the army coming his way, was airlifting reinforcements from the 15th Corps, fresh from the victory over the Japanese at the Battle of Admin Box in Arakan, to join the 4th Corps in Imphal. He was also moving 33 Corps, including the 161st Indian Brigade and the 2nd British Infantry Brigade, from South India up to the northeast corner to reinforce Kohima. Whilst General Slim's 14th Army didn't scare the Japanese, after all, their impression of the British and Commonwealth troops was that they either ran away or surrendered, General Mutaguchi was keen to move with speed. His desire for speed was to create a fatal flaw in his offensive. In a bid to seize Kohima swiftly, the Japanese decided to travel light. They carried just 20 days' food supplies through the jungles and over those hills towards the battle. They also advanced with only the barest of artillery support. Fundamentally, if it couldn't be manhandled, it was left behind. Both of those would have critical implications. Before I go on, just a reminder to sign up for my free weekly newsletter so you don't miss my latest releases. Do it at the end, there's a link in the description. Anyway, back to the story. The terrain over which the Japanese intended to advance was riddled with hills and valleys, almost like a spread out fingers on a hand, up and down, up and down. Amazingly, despite the sheer scale of these barriers and the fact that most of the route lay through dense jungle, Sato's division managed to reach Kohima in less than a month. By the 3rd of April 1944, they were probing the Allied defences. Meanwhile to the south, Imphal had been surrounded. Just for the record, I'm going to leave the actual Battle of Imphal for another day, and likewise, I'm not going to mention every British regiment who fought at the 10-week Battle of Kohima, although I've listed them in the description. Against those advancing 12,000 Japanese, the British had a garrison of 2,500 men, commanded by former Chindit, Colonel Hugh Richards. And of them, only 1,500 were combat soldiers. The largest contingent were 420 men of the 4th Battalion, Queen's Own West Kent Regiment. They were positioned in the centre of the Kohima Ridge, on a raised point called Garrison Hill. They were joined by a company of the Indian 7th Rajput Regiment. Both of these were the advance guard of the 161st Indian Brigade that was hurriedly being sent to Kohima by General William Slim. They were the only contingents to arrive before the Japanese slammed the door shut. The other combat units on the ridge uh, were some companies from the Burma Regiment and also the 1st Assam Regiment and the Assam Rifles. Also present were a raw battalion recently arrived from Nepal, home of the Gurkhas. To augment his defence, Richards organised the non-com troops who had been serving in various supply and communication capacities, as well as as many convalescing troops as could walk into a composite force. As the Japanese net closed around Kohima, the only support the defenders received was from more elements of the 161st Brigade, two miles away. Despite themselves being surrounded, they were able to provide crucial artillery support to the besieged garrison on the ridge. For the next two weeks, the defenders at Kohima were subjected to a relentless assault by the Japanese. Throwing caution to the wind, the Japanese used their numerical advantage to try and simply steamroller the British and Indian defenders aside. For instance, during the night of the 9th, 10th of April, the Japanese 58th Regiment attacked every 30 minutes. Over time, the ridge started to resemble the Western Front in World War I. The Allies were pushed back into a smaller and smaller area where there was no safe ground. Even casualties waiting at the medical stations were hit by bullets as they lay on makeshift stretchers. Drinking water started to run low. Any attempts to reach the freshwater springs had to be made at night to avoid Japanese snipers. Eventually, Colonel Richards had to ration each soldier to one solitary pint of water per day. One pint of water whilst fighting for your life in temperatures of around 30 degrees Celsius and humidity of over 70%. The heaviest fighting took place at the north end of the ridge around the deputy commissioner's house. Eventually, the Japanese captured the house and the British West Kent Regiment were forced back across the tennis court. And there, they dug in at the western end with the Japanese at the other side of the court. The aptly named Battle of the Tennis Court was almost like something out of the First World War. The two sides were so close that in a somewhat macabre and surreal alternative to a tennis match, they would take turns lobbing hand grenades into each other's trenches. And over that tiny space in between them, the Japanese continued to launch almost suicidal attacks. 
On the 12th of April, the attackers swapped their boots for sports plimsolls and silently crossed the tennis court, almost overrunning the British lines. And the fighting on both sides was brutal. Lance Corporal John Harmon of the Queen's Own West Kent Regiment was the 29-year-old son of a millionaire who owned Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel. Just a couple of days into the battle, he ran unaccompanied 35 yards to attack a Japanese machine gun nest. He pulled a pin out of the grenade with a four-second fuse, calmly counted to three, and then tossed it in. The following day, he single-handedly charged another machine gun nest. He killed all four occupants, shooting three and bayoneting the fourth. Afterwards, despite the urgings of his comrades, he calmly walked back towards the British lines without a care in the world. He'd almost reached safety when he was hit by a Japanese sniper. He died in his officer's arms with the words, It was worth it. I got the lot. Harmon was awarded the Victoria Cross. Across the whole ridge, the fighting was equally hard, close and grim. Apart from the artillery support from two miles away, only two things saved the defenders. Firstly, they received supplies, including ammunition and water, from airdrops. Supplying a cut-off army in the jungle by air had already been tested in Ord Wingate's Chindit raids during the previous 12 months, and more recently at the Battle of Admin Box. Now at Kohima and Impal, it was ratcheted up to a level with over 400 tonnes of supplies being dropped every day. The second thing that saved the defenders at Kohima was sheer bloody-mindedness. The Japanese were fanatical in their attacks, and famous for refusing to surrender. Indeed, that attitude shaped their horrific treatment of allied POWs. And those stories of Japanese cruelty on such things as the Burma-Thailand Railway were well known to the defenders at Kohima. It's interesting to reflect that by treating allied prisoners with contempt and cruelty, the Japanese had created a rod for their own backs here. The defenders were not minded to surrender. It was kill or be killed. Every inch of ground was fought for and looked like it had been. Finally, on the 18th of April, the 1st Punjab Regiment, advancing from Dimapur, broke through the Japanese lines to the besieged garrison, which was defending an area now of just 350 square metres. The siege had been lifted, but the Battle of Kohima was not over. It simply entered a new and equally vicious stage as the Japanese refused to back down and even tried to resume their offensive. The Punjabs arrived at the tennis court and were immediately under ferocious attack from the Japanese. Another grenade tossing match entailed, during which Jemadar Mohammed Rafiq was to earn the military cross for leading a platoon to attack a Japanese bunker on the far side. It's a measure of the tenacity and ferociousness of the Japanese that the Punjabs were to suffer 120 casualties in the next three days. They were replaced by the 1st Battalion, the Royal Berkshire Regiment, who were to face nightly attacks by their enemy, which descended into vicious hand to hand fighting to cling on to their positions. Of the 100 men from B Company, the Royal Berkshires who went in, only 60 came out. Still the fighting went on. By now the 4th Infantry Brigade, including the Royal Norfolk Regiment, had arrived and engaged in the battle. One of the officers of the Royal Norfolk Regiment was 26-year-old Captain John Randall. Randall had actually been born in India and had graduated from Oxford University. One of his best friends at university was Leonard Cheshire, who would be awarded the Victoria Cross during the war. On the 4th of May, whilst commanding B Company of the 2nd Battalion, he was wounded in the knee by a Japanese grenade. Despite his injury, he refused to be evacuated and instead went out into the narrow space of no man's land to fetch in wounded British soldiers. Two days later, he led an attack on yet another Japanese machine gun. Hardly able to walk, let alone run, he somehow managed to outsprint his men and decided to buy time for them to reach the machine gun. He threw himself across the slit in the bunker. His body was riddled with bullets but his selfless and brave act enabled his men to jump in and finish off the Japanese defenders. Captain Randall was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. There was a third VC awarded during the battles of Imphal and Kohima. 18-year-old Abdul Hafiz of the Indian Army received Britain's highest medal for valour at Imphal. Like Harmon and Randall, his was a posthumous award, which is an indication of just how grim and nasty this battle was. By the 10th of May, the British were able to bring tanks into the battle, and by the 13th, most of the positions on the ridge had been retaken, with the 2nd Battalion Royal Dorset Regiment finally taking what remained of the Deputy Commissioner's bungalow. General Sato assessed the situation. His men were starving. They had no medical support. For the first time, Japanese soldiers were even starting to surrender, be it in very small numbers. Finally, in a break with tradition, 
he ordered his Japanese soldiers to withdraw on the 15th of May. The myth of the all-conquering Japanese soldiers in Southeast Asia was broken. It took a further month for the British 2nd Division, advancing from Kohima, to meet up with the 5th Indian Division coming north and open up the road to Imphal. The fact that it took 38 days to advance the 30 miles from Kohima indicates the unyielding opposition from the Japanese, even as they face starvation and defeat. Nevertheless, with those units linking up on the 22nd of June, the battles of Kohima and Imphal officially came to a close. The Japanese 15th Army had advanced with 85,000 men. They lost 53,000, the vast majority to disease and starvation. Their own retreat into Burma was described by many as the road of bones for the numbers of dead and dying left along the route. Only 12,000 made it back to Japan, an incredible 87% casualty figure. In comparison, the British, and I include Indians, Burmese, Nepalese, losses amounted to 12,500 killed or wounded at Imphal and a further 4,000 casualties at Kohima. The battles of Imphal and Kohima were the high watermark of the Japanese campaign in Southeast Asia. Their invasion of India had been defeated. And as General Slim told his victorious army, the Japanese would never come back. And they didn't. The material losses suffered by the Japanese seriously eroded their ability to even hold Burma. But equally importantly as the military victory for the Allies was its psychological impact. For the first time, the British and the British Indian armies had defeated the Japanese in a major battle. The image of Japan's soldiers as invincible was over. And that new confidence, together with growing air and land superiority, would turn the tide of the war in Southeast Asia. General Slim was to use the victory at Kohima as a springboard to go on the offensive. By May 1945, the Japanese had been pushed out of Burma. On the back of a poll in 2013, the National Army Museum in London announced that Kohima was Britain's greatest battle. Others have called it the Stalingrad in the East. And yet, for most people, it's a forgotten battle. In fact, if people recognise the name Kohima at all, it's in the Kohima epitaph, which is included in most Remembrance Sunday services. Actually written towards the end of the First World War by John Maxwell Edmonds, its words can be found on the memorial to the British 2nd Division at the Commonwealth War Cemetery at Kohima. On the site of the Deputy Commissioner's house, where the Battle of the Tennis Court was so bitterly fought, lie 1,420 British soldiers at peace. A memorial also remembers the 900 plus Sikh and Hindu soldiers who were cremated in accordance with their religious rites. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. Well, thanks for joining me today and please check out my other videos. And if you want to learn more about British history and keep up to date with my latest stories, then please do sign up for my free weekly newsletter. Or you can go a bit further and become a patron and supporter. In return for your support, I'll send you an exclusive supporters only video every month. Click on the links appearing now and in the description. And thanks to Michael, Ed, Joe, Craig, Jeremy for your support already. Thanks for watching. Keep well. And I'll see you again very soon.